How did you go from wrestler to manager? You managed uh, Viscera, correct? Yeah. The transition from wrestler to manager came from just the ability to talk. And at this point, I had converted to a heel. And, and Vince had always referred to me as an agitator. Damn it, smile. Correct their English. Use big words. So they were repackaging um, Viscera, who was coming back, and they repackaged him as Big Daddy V. And I think it may have been Ed Kofsky who may have floated the idea because they were starting to bring managers back. Remember, they had Runjan Singh with Great Kali. And managers, for those that remember, there was a time where managers were the most vital part of a, an antagonist's persona yeah. and all this and all that. So that was a great opportunity, again, for me to showcase an asset, which was the ability to, to speak. And also what I thought was a detriment, which was lack of height, actually worked to my benefit because it made this, look like 6'8", it looked that much bigger. So there was stuff with this, stuff with Mark Henry. It was a lot of fun. Are you on the road just as much? If not more, because now this is uh, working in a program with Undertaker. So you are now on every live event. You are now at the top of every card and you are getting paid as such. I mean, you're not getting this Undertaker money, but to quote Chris Benoit, whatever falls off the table, you better be happy to grab. And those guys aren't dropping tens and twenties, if you know what I mean. So uh, yeah, work is good. You're, you're at the top of the card. You're working with Undertaker. Even if you shut up, you're listening to them put something together. You're hearing when he turns to you, or at the time, this was one of the top heels. So he was working with Rey Mysterio. He was working with, with, uh, with Taker and Kane. You hear when they turn to you and say, okay, so this is the time where maybe you can get involved. Because now you're learning. I'm hearing Undertaker's timing or Kane's timing on a quote unquote spot. I'm going to take that with me for the rest of my career wherever I go now. So, Talk to me about The Undertaker. You, you get to a point where you believe all of the stuff. You believe that he's dead. You believe that the room is a little <laughs> cold. And when he walks in, you do. And um, again, you don't know what people are going through. So during my time when I, it coincided with my heat and nobody liked me. And he's the godfather. He's the guy. And uh, every time I wanted to go talk to him, he just, he just looked like he just couldn't be bothered. He just looked so tired and annoyed. And I always thought it was because of me. Turns out he was going through a divorce. <laughs> and I had no idea. But again, you internalize and you're paranoid. And so finally I go to him and I talk to him. Hey, listen, man, I have a lot of heat. Da, da, da. And he's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I got the bottle you sent to my room. You didn't need to do that, but thank you. That's the right thing to do. And the fact that you're coming to talk to me says something. You've been having good matches with Rob and whatever and da-da-da. And then after WrestleMania, I said, can I please come back in the locker room? He said, yeah, man, of course you can. And I have to credit Tommy Dreamer and Edge for smoothing over my relationship because Undertaker didn't know me. Who am I to him? Man? He's got plenty of stuff to worry about. But they would tell him stories of some of my antics on the road or he would watch some of my matches and he'd see I wasn't the bad guy that everyone was portraying me to be. And at the end of the day, he's a dad. He was going through a divorce. He was getting remarried. He missed his kids just as much as anyone else did. And, did a, and a real nice guy. And I got to wrestle him. You know, Big Daddy V, uh, we were on a tour of South America. And Big Daddy V, unfortunately, fell ill and went home. And there were still eight nights left. And I remember Dean Malenko was the agent. He's like, I'm not switching the card. You wrestle Taker. Gladly. Gladly. What was that like? It's almost as if, and you can appreciate this because you always had a, a reputation amongst your peers as a good worker, and that's the best reputation that you can have. Not that he's stiff, not that he's, oh, he sells a lot of merch, he's a good brother. No, 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 he can go. And you don't hear that anymore, he can work. He's light as a feather, boy, oh boy. With Undertaker, I didn't have to say a word because anything I call, he's going to call over. I could hear him in my head, Mike, I swear to you. He would look down at his knee, and I heard him say, go for the leg. And even if he didn't, it was the right thing to do. It only confirmed for me, A, that my instincts and training were correct, and B, there's a little bit of puffy-chestedness when you can walk through the curtain the fourth or fifth night with Undertaker, and he's giving you the little double squeeze. You can kind of walk up a little higher past your peers. Not like you're a swinging dick or nothing, but hey, I can go. I'm pretty good. If this was a sport that was based truly on merit, which it isn't, 
I'd, I'd be accepted. And that's all I ever want. Talk to me about going uh, from manager now. So you're a wrestler, manager, mm-hmm. to commentator. Just keep the checks coming. <laughs> that's it. Uh, Joey Styles and Bruce Pritchard came to me and said, your name came up in a meeting and uh, they want you to do commentary for ECW. And Joey Styles said, you know something? You could be in that chair forever. And that was my mindset. Oh my gosh, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fade off into the sunset here. And the thing is, by then I had already been WWE for a little while. So every three years you renegotiate a contract. So I'm now on like my, I think, second or third contract now, which in any fee-for-service industry, you're going to get an increase, whether it be exponential or not. So I'm at a point now where I'm making a little bit of cashish here, even more than I've ever had. And uh, you're on the road now, so your cars and your hotels are also paid for. And you can expense meals. And um, I never abused that, but a lot of guys did. So if you and I went to dinner, you would turn in the receipt, dinner with me, I would turn in the receipt, dinner with you. That's just ethically wrong. But there were all of a sudden all these perks. And I loved it because you are now on that show for 57 minutes instead of six. And you can speak to me. My father enjoyed me doing commentary more than, I heard you said this. Oh, you mentioned uh, Kamala. Does Vince get mad? So much comes from it. So I really enjoyed that a lot. I loved your commentary. I did. Somebody had to. So thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you wouldn't just call him, like, for instance, you wouldn't just say, Jack Swagger, you'd say the All American American. Yeah. Jack Swagger. Oh, branding you know, you'd, is you'd, big. You'd, you'd oh, but you, but no one did it like you. You'd always try and add a little something extra when you explain things. You explain them very well. Uh, what kind of freedom did you have when you were a commentator? In the beginning, I had a ton because no one knew what to expect. You know, I, I'm a big baseball guy. You sign a guy and you put him in hitting eighth in the lineup. You don't expect anything, and all of a sudden the guy starts getting timely hits and hitting some big doubles and has a good at bat and all of a sudden you move him up a little bit. Now he's hitting sixth and fifth. And other. So in the beginning, they didn't bother me. And then there was good positive feedback. The, the boys loved it because I called it like a sport. Sergeant Slaughter said to me, you, you call it like a sport. It was the greatest thing anyone could say to me. And it's all I ever wanted to do because a big problem I always had with wrestling was the lack of authenticity Right? I've said this a million times. The wrestler named Big Show is seven foot four and he's 400 pounds, and Rey Mysterio is five foot six and 180, and Big Show punches Rey Mysterio in the face. There's no reason Rey Mysterio shouldn't be dead. How do I explain that and still maintain some type of integrity and validity with what I do for a living? So I thought the sport part was important. And then some of my references, I think, were a little only for me. But then after a while, Vince wanted me to be much more antagonistic. and to Vince's credit, do you know people still hate me to this day? And I don't like to use that word. They loathe and dislike me to this day as an announcer because of the character that Vince fashioned so many years ago. It's a testament to Vince, to be honest with you. Can you give me an example of what Vince told you to work on or try that really worked? He would express to me, he being Vince, uh, one, don't use pronouns. Uh, his experiences with teachers. He used to hate it when his teacher smiled. He used to hate it when his teacher would correct his English. He used to hate it when his teacher would go on and on. And he used to hate it when his teacher would give him a political slant. That's all Vince ever said to me. I went home and wrote down these Vince hated that, hated that. So every time I was on camera, go back and look, big smile. Every time. Yeah. And as far as content, Start to hear. I, you can pinpoint the time where I stop going from the, well, you remember back in the day when Jimmy Snook and Roddy Piper and I go to the, well, back in 1967, Tatsumi Fujinami used the Cobra arm lock. That's all Vince. Be long-winded. Be annoying. Make me roll my eyes. It worked. <laughs> what was it like working with Kevin Dunn? Another, see, the thing with WWE is you, you revere these people for their, their creativity. Because if you put most of these people in any other walk of life, they're, they're just anyone. Undertaker, Edge has a great, actually Val Venus's sister, I think, was married to or dated Edge. And, and Val Venus's sister had a great line about Edge that if he wasn't a wrestler, he would just be a scrawny six foot four guy. She's right. So with regards to Kevin Dunn, All those videos that you and I have shed a tear over, my sacrifice, the ones to Creed and Kurt, oh my gosh, there's Kevin Dunn. 
and um, another guy named Adam Panucci. The fact that Kevin Dunn can make you look wonderful, the fact that Kevin Dunn can make you remember a moment, you revere him. So I hung on his every word, and uh, I knew that he was cutthroat, but if he was giving you a hard time, it's because something wasn't good for the product. It wasn't because he just wanted to bust your nut. So uh, you revere these people, and you take the best qualities from them. I learned how to produce. I produced for Impact Wrestling. I learned that by watching Kevin Dunn. Talk to you about working with uh, JR. Again, you you have to get over the intimidation of these these larger than life characters, and you also have to understand that a lot of these guys are old school, older school than you and I, and from a much different place than you and I. None of them are from Bayside, Queens, New York. No, no, no. So you have to take all the preconceived notions that they have. With Jr., I had to come in willingly. I'm under your learning tree. Please, if you have time, please listen. Please watch. The first thing he did me did to me did for me was give me a four-page printout, front and back, of all different words, different ways to say strong, lofty, brute, powerful. When I tell you, that's the, still to this day one of the most valuable things. I mean, I've committed most of them to memory. And uh, organic. He's very big into organic. Let it develop. Tell the story. So that's what I gleaned from JR. And uh, we rode together a couple of times. Great Texas barbecue. I got to know his wife, Jan, who sadly passed. He's a good man. But uh, I think wrestling, wrestling leaves a lot of people lonely. And I, I didn't want to be that way. How'd you like working with Jerry Waller? Again, another legend, another absolute legend. Uh, Jerry Lawler taught me, don't, don't look at your format too much. So don't look at your script. People don't like that word. Don't look at who's going to win. Don't look at who's coming out. Because that way, you'll be a little bit more you know, organic. Uh, again, another guy that is so woven into the fabric of wrestling history, you, you bite your tongue because you want to ask him about Tommy Rich. You want to ask him about Andy Kaufman, but you don't want to be a mark. So you just hope you're close enough to him when he tells a story. <laughs> How'd you like working with Booker T? Book was great. Book was kind to me. Uh, Book, it's another guy. See, I find that a lot of people in wrestling, when they're combative towards you it's because they have an insecurity book's got no insecurities he's got no need to have any insecurity. he could beat you up right he's bigger than you he's taller than you he's richer than you like whatever the insecurities are book don't have any of them but what stands out to me with booker is is his family his wife uh, charmel i was in houston and i my rental the rental car place had closed or whatever it was and i was standing out there and charmel and booker pulled up and Booker lives there, okay? He didn't fly in there. He lives there. Do you need a ride? Do you want to stay with us? And I was so, like, embarrassed. I was like, no, no, thank, it's, thank you so much. Thank you, no, no. I didn't have a, I took a cab. I didn't have a car. But I didn't have the, the yes, please. I didn't know. I thought they were just being polite. They weren't. That's who they are. Booker's a great guy.